My name is Ross Peterson. I'm a retired professor of history, and I've been asked to uh, conduct for a short moment this morning to give a little, uh, or this afternoon, a little background. Uh, first of all, in behalf of Utah State University and the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, we would like to welcome you. We appreciate uh, that you are here, and we definitely appreciate the reason you came. And for the uh, wonderful decade we've had with Phil and Deborah in our midst. And so, uh, again, we appreciate your willingness to come and share uh, a few moments with them and with us. Uh, I think it's been uh, soon going on 25 years that uh, Leonard Arrington, after he had uh, retired from his positions at BYU and with the LDS Church, uh, announced that he was going to give his papers, his collection, along with his colleague George Ellsworth and others to USU's library. And the university at that time began thinking and within the college about a program in religious studies. Leonard, during the last four years of his life, got intimately involved with the university on outlining some of the things that he would like to see. Uh, he did not say, I want a chair named after me. He did say, it would be nice to have a lecture series named after me, which we have had now since uh, Leonard gave the first one. Uh, and then the, the university began the process of, of having and seeking uh, endowed chairs and a, and a program simultaneously in religious studies, which for a state university, many people thought this might be some kind of gamble. But uh, through leadership at the university and especially through until Leonard passed away in 1999, uh, we began putting in motion a program that, ha that has resulted in two chairs. One, the Red family uh, funded originally to help set up the program and bring in a professor in religious studies, which Professor uh, Ravi Gupta occupies that chair now. And then uh, a few years following Leonard's passing, and after we had uh, solved any of the issues relative to the collection of his uh, resources here at the university, we announced that we would begin searching uh, for a, a chair in Mormon history and culture named in honor of Leonard Arrington. And uh, it, it was during this period where I left the university for a while, and, and they were wise in choosing as the first occupant of the chair, uh, Dr. Phil Barlow. And introduce Dr. Barlow this evening, I would like to introduce you to, if you don't already know him, our Dean of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, Joe Ward. It is my great honor to introduce our speaker, Philip L. Barlow, a nationally known expert in the field of Mormon culture and history, who will retire from Utah State University at the end of the year as the Leonard J. Arrington Endowed Chair in Mormon Studies. The Arrington Chair, first such Mormon history chair in the world, is housed in the Religious Studies program within the History Department within the College of Humanities and Social Science here at USU. Barlow joined us as the first Arrington Chair in 2007, following a prestigious career as a professor and chair of the Department of Theological Studies at Hanover College in Indiana. Previously, he had received his master's degree in the history of Christianity from Harvard University, as well as his Doctor of Theology in American Religious History and Culture from the Harvard Divinity School. In his role as Arrington Chair, Phil Barlow has served as an ambassador for the university in numerous settings, both by planning events and by his national scholarly presence. He's played a crucial role in building Utah State University's Religious Studies program ever since its inception. 
He's a prolific scholar who's published several books that have helped to define his field. Among his many important works are the book Mormons in the Bible, The Place of Latter-day Saints in American Religion, published by Oxford University Press and with a new edition in 2013, as well as the Oxford Handbook of Mormonism, which Oxford published in 2015, which he co-edited with Terrell Givens. His new historical atlas of religion in America, Oxford University Press 2001, which he co-authored with Edward Scott Gusted, have become standards in the field. In addition to his many books, Phil Barlow's scholarly publications include about three dozen journal articles and book chapters exploring questions of religious pluralism, Mormon history, and religious biography. Following his retirement from USU, Phil will join Brigham Young University's Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship as its associate director with responsibility for its scholarly programs. He will continue his research and writing at the Maxwell Institute, as well as coordinate scholarly mentoring and supervise the Institute's various seminars, lectures, workshops, and discussion series. We have been so proud to have Phil as a leading member of our faculty, not only in the program, the department, the college, indeed the university. And so please join me in welcoming Phil Barlow for his last lecture. Okay. Mm. Friends, I'm um, of course happy to be here and touch the few of you I've been able to glimpse and talk to already. Um, I'm very touched that you would bother to um, take time out of your day to get here and uh, some of you from far away. And I'm tempted, of course, to start um, Thanking, um, thanking you, but if I got very involved in that, it would, um, that would be a long evening and seem like a nightmare scene from, from the Oscar Awards or something like that. So um, I won't do that, but it is pleasing to be uh, back home in our beautiful valley at this um, university that I love dearly and among you and where where we play serious football these days. Uh, I do think the university as a whole, I love the very idea of the university. Deborah and I long ago, decades ago, concluded that we would never want to live far from one. And I love the mission and the history of our Utah State University. I have great fondness and high regard for my associates, uh, some of whom are here. Um, again, that would be um, maybe this would be the wrong time to get too involved in particular names, but um, they're within me. I'll just represent that by a memo I got from my colleague and friend down at Brigham Young University, George Handley, a scholar who recently uh, came up for our God and Smog conference. And you are sinners and errant if you miss the God and Smog conference. Uh, George um, wrote me an email after the fact because um, a family illness prevented my attendance. And he concluded his admiring remarks with this thought. I loved the experience. Your colleagues there are fabulous and must have been hard to part with. That's true. I'm grateful for donors who have made this program possible, both, um, both the Arrington position to have that come into existence, but also the Red Chair and the Religious Studies program as a whole, and the college and the university as a whole. And um, I particularly am grateful for my student friends over the years, and many of you whom I um, have glimpsed um, here today. I, in certain kinds of classes, used to um, tell them on the 
first or second day of class um, about how to get an A in this course, and I'd describe you do such and such for an adequate grade like you're going to get credit here, and it requires something more from some strong effort and performance um, to get in the B or B-plus range. And if you're superb at everything I ask you to do and thinking critically and responding well to all the queries put to you and that you add to the class, then you get an A minus. <laughs> and the only way that you will get an A in this course is if you teach me something new. And I gave out some A's in my career. Uh, so that happened regularly. And in truth, if you didn't happen to be an A student at religious studies but were um, a superb skateboarder or racquetball player or pianist, um, most everybody has taught me some things along the way. So thanks to everybody. Um, Susan, especially glad to have you here, and it's been um, an honor um, more than I'm worthy of to be associated with the name of Leonard Arrington for such a long time, who did so much um, for the study of religion and for his own religion and for the study of a bunch of other stuff and for this university. Uh, my title is, as some of you have noticed, The End of Religion. That's an abbreviation for a more grand title. Originally, um, I had envisioned initially in bright lights and big letters, the end of religion and the end of Philip Barlow. <laughs> <laughs> but Ravi, who likes very few of my ideas, frowned at that, so the end of religion. Uh, Janelle Hyatt, my friend who's the director of communications for the college, um, stopped me in the hall the other day, however, and said, what the heck? She said some other things with her eyes. I knew what she was thinking, but she said with her lips, what the heck? Um, how am I supposed to send word out about this? I don't know what that means. And so here's what I mean by the end of religion. I, re I mean its demise, its termination, its death, as hoped for by a good many critics of religion. Uh, a dismissal of religion wholesale as unworthy of notice except for how can we get rid of it because it is a form of illness and it gets in the way of human flourishing and it produces fanatics and superstition and such. And I mean the end of religion in a second sense and that is its purpose, its reason for being, its function, what it is. And while saying goodbye to you tonight, it's possible I might get a little personal here and there in a way that would offend some of my religious studies colleagues, who knows, um, because we um, are here as religious studies scholars not to promote or denigrate religion, but to study it and to analyze it and leave personal skepticism or personal advocacy um, for other people or if we're religious or critical of religion um, for our personal lives. But I might get a little personal because um, what are they going to do, fire me? <laughs> <laughs> so while saying goodbye to you, I'll suggest that critiques of religion meant, meant to hasten its death are not vacuous, except for when they are vacuous, but in the hands and on the uh, typewriters of serious thinkers and critics, they're not vacuous, but they are problematic, they are complicated, and they are responded to. So pro problematic are these critiques when they're intended to dismiss religion wholesale, and when coupled with a consideration, uh, so problematic is that, but when coupled with a consideration of what religion in its, I think we just went dead, shall I pause? Are, you're hearing me in the recording, okay. How about when I'm speaking without a mic? Are you hearing me back there all right? I'll do that until rescue comes to me. <coughs> Ross, my mother, 
instructed me more than once that I'm not good at projecting, so I'll hope for your wave back there. Um, when we consider religion's end, its purpose, its role, what it is in its essence, and critical responses to the criticism of religion wholesale, um, it seems to me that its demise is unlikely. In other words, religion's end works against religion's end. Its reason for being militates against its termination. If there appears to be time, I may offer an example or two from, I could from several movements, but because I'm saying goodbye as the Leonard Arrington Chair of Mormon History and Culture, I might give an example from the realm of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and its culture. The LDS Church, President Nelson of the LDS Church just um, recently initiated a move to banish the word Mormon and Mormonism um, from church parlance. Um, and the primary motive behind that, which has been on his mind for a number of years before he became the president of the church, is that we're not, uh, Mormons are not disciples of Mormon. That's a name that was a nickname um, first applied, Mormonites, shortened to Mormons by um, critics of the church about this new sect that had appeared in uh, the American historical scene. And so um, church members have sometimes uh, grappled with the fact that they're accused by their evangelical critics and others of not being Christians. So um, I've got 60 years or so of habit in saying the words Mormon and Mormonism, both as a scholar and as it happens, I'm a practicing member of the faith. So if I uh, slip up there, no offense meant to you members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. <laughs> Um, also, um, also, the term Mormon and Mormonism refers in scholarly usage to a good deal more than the institutional church, and so um, without hoping to um, cause offense, that's a problem too. We're not always talking about the organizational church, so um, forgive me if I mess that up, but that's partial preemptive um, description. Okay, religion's demise. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. <laughs> no hell below us, above us only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. Imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do, nothing to kill or die for, and no religion too. Imagine all the people living life in peace. Imagine no possessions, no need for greed or hunger, a brotherhood of man. Imagine all the people sharing all the world. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will live happily ever after as one. <clears throat> it's also appealing its author was an ingenious, gifted man, not an educated man, by the way, in a formal sense, John Lennon, but a smart dude. Um, British polls um, have pointed out, Rolling Stone pointed out, that John Lennon is construed uh, by Brits as the seventh greatest Briton ever. There's been a lot of Brits. This song has its appeal, and it has, like its lyrics, a simple and, <coughs> excuse me, pleasing melody. I was 50 years of age or so before Deborah taught me that John Lennon was my favorite Beatle, unbeknownst to me. <laughs> um, his voice, his edgier voice than Mr. McCartney's, and the lyrics for what, which he was responsible um, touched me, stimulated me, provoked me. But there are complications to this song that um, so much of the world, you know, certainly America, Britain, elsewhere, are entranced with. One of them is John Lennon's personal life, which in many ways was a train wreck. 
He had a streak of considerable cruelty. He fought repeatedly with men, both demonstrably by others and by his own admission, and he chronically beat women. He was beset by drugs. He was literally clinically addicted to television, and he helped make drug abuse chic to the ongoing devastation of an untold number of lives. A second complication with Hep Happily Ever After, as cast in this song, is that Lenin later explained that the abolition of religion or God is not what he had in mind. It was more about contending religions, contending sects, who contended. The world wasn't at peace and wasn't at one um, too often under their hands. On his famous quip about the Beatles being more popular than Christ, he said, it's just an expression, meaning the Beatles seem to me to have more influence over the youth of today than Christ. Now, I wasn't saying that's a good idea, cause, cause, British accent that I can't duplicate, cause, I'm one of Christ's biggest fans. And if I can turn the focus of the Beatles on to Christ's message, then that's what we're here to do. He was impatient with institutional religion. He was impatient with what he took to be hypocrisy for those who were too uptight in reacting to his comments. But he explained them thus. John Lennon's exegesis of John Lennon. The year following, a third complication, the year following the 1971 release of his historic song, Imagine, Lennon wrote a desperate letter to, of all people, an American televangelist, and a Pentecostal one at that, Oral Roberts, confessing his, Lennon's, dependence on drugs, <coughs> excuse me, drugs, and his fear of facing up to the problems of life. He enclosed a gift for the Oral Roberts University um, after quoting the line, money can't buy me love from another of his very popular songs. He wrote to Roberts, it's true. The point is this, I want happiness. I don't want to keep on with drugs. Explain to me what Christianity can do for me. Is it phony? Can he love me? I want out of hell. Sometimes dismissals are complicated. <clears throat> Despite these dimensions of Lennon's private reality, his public anthem, as generally construed, captures the swooning hearts of tens of millions all these years after his death. Wouldn't it be swell if there were no religion? John Lennon had traits that I still admire, including a genius for song and lyric. More erudite critics of religion were more thoroughgoing than he in their condemnation of religion. In fact, many diagnose religion as a sickness. Is religion, in its essence, essence six? Since our time here together is brief, I'm going to suggest four examples of these kinds of charges. Religion is unreasonable. It breeds superstition. Is that true? Do you know anybody who's religious who's superstitious and unreasonable? Thank you. I always have a coughing sort of a throat. Is it unreasonable? Are, are, are believers unreasonable? And do you know one? Mm. Duh. <laughs> <laughs> That's about as easy a charge as can you walk on this here rug? Right? There's no shortage of that, so it's not a vacuous charge. And one cannot think too well. But I want to suggest one can think too much. 
one can misunderstand that reason, some sort of Euclidean rigid logic, is a sufficient way to make one's way in life and to take stock of reality. One could argue, uh, some do argue indeed, that reason is the only sufficient way to take stock of reality. But as the German philosopher writer said about the time, um, not too long before Joseph Smith launched his own religious movement in the Americas, Goethe says, reality divided by reason leaves a remainder. The world is not only stranger than we know, the world reality is stranger than we're equipped to know, than we can know. And I did tend to start my classes, did I not, my daughter, with reality could be otherwise. Otherwise than you think it is, and you know that's true because you thought of it a little differently five years ago and 20 years ago. and and. Unless you're brain dead, unless we're brain dead, we're learning and it looks a little different, right? So it is different than we think it is. <clears throat> there is a necessity beyond reason. You can't think too well. You can't think too rigorously, but you can think proportionately too much. You can um, be inured, you can be numb to the necessity of a measure of intuition in making your way in life. You can be out of touch with body knowledge and body memory as if your name were Barlow and it had been a while since your jump shot was successful, you could verify. Um, the worlds of art, of music, of imagination, of friendship, of love and inspiration are very real realms and um, I'm currently experimenting with um, a class in mindfulness by a very good and experienced teacher um, down at BYU, of all places, who's drawing on wisdom over centuries and centuries and centuries and um, having great fun learning a deeper, wider consciousness of things I already knew but didn't know that I knew. Uh, reason is essential, not sufficient. A second challenge of course, classically comes from Karl Marx and what Karl Marx represents. Religion is the sigh of the oppressed. Religion is the opium of the people. That is to say, we rulers promise to let you have your religious beliefs if you promise to keep your eyes cast towards heaven with its pie in the sky rewards and you promise to let us be the boss of everything down here on earth. We got a deal? That bothered Marx, and with his brilliant, hyperbolic and dangerous and disastrous uh, in, in many consequences, but, but with his brilliant um, manifesto, this was a critic. Is religion the opium of the people while you dream about heaven and forget to attend to matters here on the planet? Duh, that can happen, that does happen. Uh, it also happens um, with other, other things too, right? Like sports and electronic devices and entertainment generally stuff. There's lots of opiums that distract us from the business of life that matters. There are also other difficulties. Marxist revolutions themselves have suppressed and destroyed um, human thriving in their practical applications in many dramatic instances you wouldn't need reminders about. Another difficulty with this charge, if it's construed as dismissing religion as a whole, is that the core teachings of diverse religions certainly including those um, represented in the Book of Mormon, champion justice and freedom and condemn inequality and rigid imposed system of class and privilege that might have pleased Karl Marx. Many religions without destruction 
parallel to those of um, political communist revolutions are in fact communally based in whole or in part. As an example, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints surrendered its more thoroughgoing communalism of the 19th century at the 20th century's beginning and accepted the basis of capitalism in order to survive in its host society as it negotiated a reconciliation with federal authorities and fully rejoined the American nation. Indeed, certain aspects of Latter-day Saint culture, such as industriousness and a knack for organization and cooperation and respect for authority, famously lend themselves to success in the world of business, as names such as Romney, Marriott Huntsman, Franklin Covey, Clayton Christensen, and a small army of Mormon mafia on the faculty of the Harvard Business School over the last half century. <laughs> But elements of the church's communal past do endure, and the church enacts one of the most impressive welfare systems in the history of the world, in my judgment, um, aiding both members of its church and millions of others across time. A third major charge is the problem of human suffering, that human pain, human conflict, human calamity, is too big for either a rational or an ethical belief in the divine. Human history is soaked to its core in blood and agony of the most imaginative and unimaginable, and unimaginable sorts that you and I all learn with each year that we're on the planet. Isn't that a remarkable surprise as we go along? The problem with taking that unmistakable fact that all believers virtually come to ask themselves over time and that those who become disbelievers or were early on disbelievers, uh, the problem with dismissing religion on that basis is, as is not widely observed, that Suffering and its problem are the ground of religion. It's the very fertilizer out of which major religions tend to germinate. Religion, indeed, could be characterized, defined, described as a response to human suffering, or at least many of them can. Judaism, as far as we can make out with modern tools of biblical criticism, archaeology, anthropology, textual analysis, Judaism did not begin with a prophet declaring creation and then a bunch of stuff happened recorded in the book of Genesis. What seems to be the case is that historic Judaism's consciousness of being a people came together at a time where they came to believe that God had entered human history and released a people from suffering, from slavery. And then they looked back mythically, as historically as they could, joining stories from diverse tribes. But the consciousness of Israel historically, as far as modern criticism can tell us, began as a response to suffering and a belief in divine help. Christianity similarly did not begin in a manger, in a sweet Hallmark postcard, but began as a movement on a cross with reflection on what that meant, that this Messiah figure, this not political zealot, but revolutionary um, figure who had taught them, whom they had followed as a rabbi, as a master, and they reflected back at the time of crucifixion and afterwards about what that all meant, what the crucifixion meant, what hope after a crucifixion meant, and what all the teachings of this teacher meant, and how to put that together. Buddhism, of course, has as its first um, noble truth a 
premise that is um, inadequately um, translated as life is suffering. That's, that's complicated, but for shorthand for right now, that's, that's a necessary comprehension to even move on and make way in the world. We could say that of many diverse religions. Islam came into being, Muhammad received his revelations in a social context of great suffering, great commotion, great, great um, conflict, and great um, ignorance and causing of human suffering that Muhammad came to believe he had received revelations to set right. Um, finally, a fourth, <coughs> fourth um, major charge against religion wholesale as a sickness is Freud's. Religion in, in Freud's analysis, Freud, the same Freud who angsted deeply, tearfully, wretchedly, was unhappy for a while about to believe or not to believe in earlier years, finally came to conclude that religion was a neurosis, was wish fulfillment, um, was born of the wish for something good to be up there in the sky. Religion was like <clears throat> a great breast in the sky, an imaginary breast in the sky that we could all suckle at and be relieved of the tension of being a human being and the threat of being in a meaningless, um, precarious universe. Freud's work as a whole has been discarded in large part in modern psychology that construes itself, sometimes with considerable angst as a young discipline. Some colleague out there is going to yell at me, but that's what I think. Um, but it, it construes itself as um, much more a science than an art and um, doesn't take much of Freud's work seriously, but he remains a pioneering figure in several fronts, such as the exploration of the human unconscious and its import. In a series of important and profound works, including Civilization and Its Discontents and The Future of an Illusion, Freud maintained like Feuerbach before him and many after, that man has created God in his own image. Man, uh, using the gender imbalance terminology of his day, man created God in his own image. And that this creation is a manifestation of an unconscious wish fulfillment for the acquisition of happiness and for protection from suffering. To switch gender metaphors, which you'll remember is tricky business with Freud, religion is a vast and alluring breast, as I said earlier. Religion is too strong for many individuals to address, and when by herd instinct they band together in common cause, we call it religion, which is to say mass delusion. And religion's technique, I'm quoting Freud here, consists in depressing the value of life and distorting the picture of the real world in a delusional manner, which presupposes an intimidation of the intelligence, which is to say it's really stupid. At this price, by forcibly fixing its followers in a state of psychical infancy, and by drawing them into mass delusion, religion succeeds in sparing many people an individual neurosis, but hardly anything more. In short, religionists are clinically deluded infantile cowards who run in packs. And the antidote for such cowards and their cowardice, Freud believes, is science and scientists like him. It would be an illusion, he concludes, to suppose that we could get anywhere else what science cannot give us. Now, these are fighting words for some folks not calculated precisely to flatter religious people, and I can sympathize with their concern. However, there is no doubt in my mind that Freud has a point. Religious believers, often enough, commonly do indulge in wish fulfillment. 
Um, so do you and I on religious or non-religious uh, topics. Evidence suggesting this could be marshaled indefinitely. It is part of my daily experience sometimes as I think myself and as I teach and encounter true believers of various stripes. Although I personally happen to have quite a deep faith in God, I am at least as sure as Freud is about the reality of a prevalent dynamic of wish fulfillment in the religious world. The problem here, it seems to me, is not that wish fulfillment is uncommon or not that Freud uh, was lacking in, in an insight. Um, it's the, the problem, rather, is that Freud's faith is overgrown. He is too sure that by noticing and analyzing the phenomenon of wish fulfillment that he is dispensed with religion as an orientation for healthy and sane people. This seems to me a problem on several grounds. First, Freud seems to suggest that the acquisition of human knowledge can come only on rational terms and that these terms are of value solely if grounded on the scientific model. This position, however, is not merely science. It is scientism, a surrogate religion. Instead of merely appreciating silence, Freud, appreciating it, Freud has deified the scientific method and given it exclusive status as an access to truth, which is not um, a bit fanatical um, in parallel to religious folks who don't uh, of the sort who don't respect um, religion. Science has made incalculable contributions and we are myopic and on precarious ground if we don't respect it, treasure it, value it, listen to it, read the evidence for things that science marshals. So it is essential. But science has its own presuppositions and limitations as historians of science, philosophers of science, and many scientists now understand. This is not the place to go into all that, but it seems rather hard to believe that even those scientists who take Freud's tack in the abstract follow such a proposition in their daily lives as literally as Freud seems to urge. Doing so would produce not a very impressive human being, but somebody who looks a lot like Mr. Spock or data in Star Trek. Religion cannot be so easily dismissed on grounds of wish fulfillment for another reason, and that is because human beings are more complex than little carbon-based units that walk around doing wish fulfillment. They come, we come to our persuasions by diverse paths. I have friends and acquaintances, for instance, who seem to have acquired their religious disbelief on the basis of wish fulfillment. Let me be free of the oppressive rules of my childhood. Let me dispose of the relentless call of moral and spiritual responsibility. Let God quit judging me. I don't even believe in God. Beyond this, people come to their belief and disbelief for other reasons altogether, something that religious people and skeptics and scholars of religion ought to be alert to. Fear fulfillment, as I'm not the first to point out, is one example. A talented teacher or a student does poorly because they fear failure and freeze up before shooting that foul shot at which the, before which the obnoxious coach on the other sideline has called three successive timeouts. A gifted pianist before her performance freezes up knowing that the audience has gathered only to hear her make a mistake. A hypochondriac fears illness and thus often is sick. A young girl can't learn to ride a bike because she fears she can't, comes to know she can't. This is a powerful and important dynamic for we are lamentably often driven more by our fears than by our aspirations. In other words, instead of Freud's easy wish fulfillment model, we have something like the following. A believer may believe because he wishes God to exist 
or because he fears God to exist. A skeptic may disbelieve in God because she wishes God to exist or because she fears God not to exist. And in some other setting, we could go on at length. Laziness itself in the face of existential ambiguity is a terrific cause of belief and disbelief. All these human inclinations tell us nothing, zippo, nada, about the reality of God or the divine. The fact that I wish something to be true does not prove that it's not true or that it's true. If I am a believer, is this religious reach all in my imagination? Or is the imagination a very good place to encounter the transcendent? Are aspects of my faith wish fulfillment, or are they the disclosure of the divine, a phenomenon of vocation? That's not an easy question, and the answer probably does matter at some level, if not necessarily in a religious studies classroom. But at another level, the answer may not be crucial. For the real is not, ultimate reality is not something we know. It is something in which we put our trust. And I remind us all that one does not successfully and repeatedly get out of bed in the morning without placing one's trust in something in human institutions, in the secular world, in something more transcendent. And so it goes, along with these four examples, with any attempt to dispose of religion wholesale. Can I ignore religion? It bores me. And religious people are preachy. Yeah, you could ignore it, but not without consequences. In the same sense, one can ignore a liberal education. I'm getting along just fine. I have a good paying job. Who needs to study anthropology? You can ignore all manner of things in the world, but not without consequences and attendant um, ignorance and blindness that affect by commission or by omission the map that we all carry around about what reality is. I think to draw to a near conclusion that such critiques that try to dismiss religion as an entire enterprise suffer in part from a misunderstanding of what religion's end is, what religion is, what its role is, how it functions, and where it came from. I know of one psychiatrist who was a trainer of many other psychiatrists who always taught aspiring psychiatrists to find out as soon as you can what your patient's religion is, whether he or she admit to having one or not. So the implied definition behind that psychiatric assertion is that religion is one's map of reality. Or as the theologian Paul Tillich put it in the 20th century, religion is our ultimate concern, um, be it an atheist, atheistic one or otherwise. Hence, when we, uh, seen through this light, seen through this definition or framing, when we dissolve formal, organized religion, one is left with a de facto religion, a religion surrogate, a something in the place, in the whole, where religion might go. And that something is itself subject to inquiry and subject to um, critique if one is courageous enough to and clever enough to discern one's own religion. Um, then, then we have a something that just like religion itself could be studied and could legitimately be studied in the academy. I never got around to it because my dean and the director of religious studies were such slave drivers that they kept me busy on other tasks. But I had considered, <coughs> I had considered um, teaching a course on secularism 
because it too is a thing, a cluster of habits and frame of mind that can be identified and once identified and named can be studied like any other thing, like religion itself. And there is indeed um, important recent works, Charles Taylor and others, on the subject of um, secularism and um, also there are professors whose major focus is the study of secularism at other universities. Some definitions of religion go like this. Religion is what one does with one's solitude. That's a kind of insightful, clever one. Um, it's just that it's a definition appropriate for a modern society drunk on the cliché of I am spiritual but not religious, uh, which carries with it I am atomized and don't need a group. This is the same society in which anxiety and social isolation in an era of social media is the ailment of our era. A people numb to the fact that organized groups can accomplish more than atomized individual in addressing societal ills. So a fully developed religion takes the form of community. Now I want to end with um, my sense of where I think religion comes from. Um, I only know uh, Western religion well. I am not Dominic Sir and I am not Ravi Gupta. Um, and even Western religion, my knowledge is of course limited. But as far as I can make, so we could have complex conversations. Um, but as far as I can make out, um, the seeds of the human religious impulse come something like this. First, there was a thing we call the Big Bang. There are scientific challenges to this notion, by the way, but as you all know, it's the reigning um, paradigm. There was a Big Bang, and that exploded out stuff. Cosmic shrapnel. Forces, gravities, weak force, strong force, dark energy, dark matter, particles, atoms, neutrons, quarks, strange, particles called strange by physicists, stuff and their relation and their forces and their entropies and their gravities and their anti-gravities. First there was stuff and that implies that something self-exists. Joseph Smith taught that, by the way, but um, you don't have to be a religious believer, much less a Latter-day Saint, to grasp the idea that something self-exists, which gives, and that seems weird, that something would just sit around and exist, like waiting to be a big bang somewhere, right? Um, and, um, but it exists, um, and that raises the, philosoph the old philosophical question, why is there something rather than nothing, with which um, philosophers with lots of time on their hands um, grapple. Uh, somehow, from the stuffiness of stuff, the material and chaotic forces of the stuff, a transition happened where something that we could call life occurred, slime and amoeba type stuff, cells. And that's rather a humongous, imponderable jump in reality, but that happened either by the divine hand um, or by a natural process. And with an equally big jump out of the life stuff, life grew more complicated. By Darwinian-like evolution, stuff developed only those who think that's the only dynamic um, going on. May, we may be as ignorant as ourselves who didn't know what strange particles were and quarks were a few decades ago. But by some leap, um, life leapt to, to something more, and that is consciousness. You had lizards doing stuff, and you had jaguars doing stuff. 
And out of that level of life developed um, more complex intelligences and complex consciousness until creatures who looked something like us, hominids, um, developed something more than consciousness, and that is self-consciousness. There was awe that the earliest records we have seem to suggest awe, and to have awe and be conscious of it, you had to be self-transcendent. That is, we had to have the capacity to get out our, outside ourselves and contemplate ourselves. And that's as magic as the development of consciousness or life itself. Reason came along with that. Eventually, a moral sense, as we had to learn what it meant to navigate a, an area together. And beyond that, a whole lot of people, like the majority of humans, human societies, that still remain on the earth, began to feel contingent, be aware that they were contingent beings and dependent on forces wider than ourselves, and even beckoned to something higher. To what? Sometimes this beckoning appeared in the voices of prophets, or shamans, or gurus, or wise men, or medicine women and men. To what are we beckoned? To principles, like the Eightfold Noble Path, to meaning and searching, to be something more than I have become, to grow not only in biceps and my gut, but to something finer or higher, to God or to some principle, to be aware of human suffering and to craft an answer, a response, even to be aware of some sort of grace, again, whether one is a theist or not, some sort of, to, to, to be aware of the giftedness of myself, my existence, and to be, ponder carefully relationships. So a fully blown religion, I think, has a trajectory behind us like that, a trajectory before us to who knows where, and what religion is, is a more or less thoughtful map of reality, a worldview, accompanied by a moral view and a symbol system or moving symbols like ritual to express this moral view and this reality view and done together, that is, in community. Religio, religion, the lig is like ligaments. Um, and re-ligging, reconnecting, so together in relationship. Religious people do the following in unconsciously, or if they're thoughtful or even professional level theologians, they do it with discipline. And I do it, uh, since I've acknowledged to you that in my private life I'm um, a practicing believer. Uh, theology, in practice, means to me the art and the discipline of meaning-making, followed by action, at the vortex of three streams. Theology, practicing religious thought, for me, is the art and discipline of meaning-making, followed by action, at the vortex of three streams. First, my religious tradition. Secondly, the carefully observed world. And by carefully, I mean carefully, anything science can tell us, anything scholarship can persuade me of. And my personal experience and response to all this stuff. I think all that means that whether you're a believer in the divine or not, religion, as broadly defined, ain't going anywhere. Rather, it changes forms. And it's all enough to make one think that this religion thing is worth studying. 
whether you major in business, whether you major in history or philosophy or even in the sciences, um, it's necessary to understand this stuff, including the sciences, not in a vacuum, not merely in a test tube, but in relation to the culture that you inhabit. Um, because you're operating in a world with other humans and your work may have consequence for other humans. Not to do so, not to understand the cultural influences of science, not to understand the religious dimensions of those with whom you aspire to do business, not to include it in your historical studies, is to choose to remain oblivious to or presumptuously condescending to one of the most potent sources in existence concerning human motivation and behavior. It's a little bit like um, we historians who, before the 1970s, did a lot of sophisticated historical analysis, and then as feminism, second wave feminism, rose in the 1970s, we realized our enterprise forgot half the human race. And it wasn't just, we better go figure out what women are doing, but rather that changed the entire enterprise. It mattered to men, it mattered to women, it, had, it mattered to institutions, it mattered to how we thought as a people. Now, I think that similarly, that the failure to study religion rigorously, thank you Utah State University for um, understanding that about 50 years later than some other universities, but to be the first in this area of the country to recognize that, trying to understand human culture, human behaviors, individuals and groups and whole cultures in relation to one another is a little bit like trying to understand a football game where one quarter of the players are invisible. I'm saying goodbye officially to Utah State University with this talk, sorta, but I'm still employed and doing sneaky work on the side until December 31st. Um, but um, personal circumstances have um, prompted me to, to take a pause and say goodbye to the university, but George Handley was right. Uh, my friends, um, my students, my colleagues up here have not been easy to leave, and um, I've gone, I've apostatized and gone south in order to have a little more space to get um, a couple of books written with which I am pregnant and need to do it. Otherwise, um, I wouldn't have left our beloved school casually. I'm deeply in debt. And if I'm in danger of being too touchy-feely, but I really love you and lots and lots of faces that I'm gazing on. So it's been a privilege, and thanks for everything. Bye-bye. <laughs>
How do you, what is your opinion on that? Yeah, thank you. Um, I meant to speak to that. The question was, I don't think the mic was on, and the question was, some people think that religion was invented just to keep people in line and tame. And I meant to get at that sort of criticism about religion by citing Marx. It's the opiate of the people precisely because it keeps you domesticated. It keeps religious folks domesticated and not um, working to gain access to the um, powers that be keeps you doing what mommy and daddy want you to do or the queen and king want you to do or the rich people want you to do. Um, so that's, that's a different form of that problem. And I suggested in response, um, certainly religion has functioned um, when people are, have their eyes set too far um, in an afterworld or in the sky in an imagined heaven whether there's a real heaven or not, they still, it still has to be imagined. Um, without um, working at what it means to um, try to form a society that's just equal and helps human flourishing, or just helping the little old man who lives next door to you who can't afford uh, his groceries and what groceries he has, he can't get up to the second floor of the apartment building. Um, then that's a kind of an opiate. We're in some sort of a drunken state, and I think Marx has a point. But also my response was many religious um, impulses and indeed practical actions share Marx's concern about the quest for equitable power structures and fostering human suffering. So it's a legitimate critique of some religious expressions. It just doesn't work as a way to dismiss religion wholesale as Marx attempted. Thank you. I'm so interested by your um, insistence on both truth, ultimate truth, as, as experienced and as interpreted, and also integrated with communal living and interest. Um, I recently read jo uh, Jonathan Haidt's new book, The Coddling of the American Mind, which I enjoyed very much. Mm -hmm. And in it, he describes the sacred, which he says for America right now is safetyism. Um, is safetyism that- Safetyism is a lovely quasi-religion, I like it. <laughs> I'm gonna make a t-shirt about that. <laughs> <laughs> and he says that the sacred is that which cannot be trumped. In other words, it trumps everything. Are you comfortable I'm, I'm, I'm thinking this through. I just want help thinking this through. Are you comfortable uh, talking about truth and love or empathy or whatever and action as that which is sacred in religion? Yeah, uh, that's good. Well. Um, I could t talk as a religious dude, or I could talk um, as a religious studies professor. So if I were going about this in the religious studies classroom, whether where it's I don't construe that it's my job to sort out which what is religiously true or not. But I do think that ignoring the human quest for truth and the importance of that would be a pedagogical mistake in the classroom. And so I would tend to adopt a strategy that took a religion like the Church of Jesus Christ or Latter-day Saints or Roman Catholicism or um, Tibetan Buddhism. And in studying those communities, I would look for the fault lines and the contested areas where the adherents themselves are contesting. If I'm a Muslim, is it part of my religion to commandeer airplanes and fly them into tall buildings to get Rid to put a fracture in the great Satan of American um, lust and capitalism and worldliness, or no, am I a Muslim practitioner for whom um, that's no less an evil than my than my atheist and my Southern Baptist friends see it as? So how is that navigated within the religious community itself? Um, but etymologically, the word sacred. Um, traces back to the idea of being set apart. 
And I do think there's a dimension that we can take the concept that comports um, with the definition you proffered, and that is um, God is that which is um, God or if uh, you can have a religion, an authentic, deeply, deeply wonderful religion like major forms of Buddhism that are not theistic, so God or what goes in God's place, ultimate truth, um, enlightenment and the best principles of being and being in relation. Um, God or, what, um, or analogies go, um, are that which are ultimate. Thou shalt have, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And you've got a lot of them. They don't just all look like the Oscar statue or ancient golden calves. Rather, anything that displaces God, anything that displaces God, including religion that starts to think of itself as its own end, including the Bible or the Quran, including small g God, your image of God, which is so precious to you that you're clutching like Job's friends, who God was really ticked off at, who spent the whole time in the book of Job only defending God, and God was ticked. Anything including God, our image of God, can be a form of idolatry and, um, and an intrusion on the sacred, I think. Um, is that about time? So thank you again, friends. Thanks. Um, so at this point, uh, I'd uh, like to uh, give a gift of appreciation on behalf of the Religious Studies Program and the History Department. Um, and the College of Humanities and Social Sciences to uh, Philip Barlow. If I can request uh, Jeannie to come forward to help me with the gift here. You'll see why in a minute. So uh, this is uh, 25 pounds. We think it's a bag of organic flour or a box, uh, but we're not exactly sure. Uh, can you help us, Dominic, as well, please? Thank you. <laughs> a lender boy like me is intimidated by such a package. Uh, we encourage you to open it, please. Okay. You got it firmly there, friends. Okay, this is like a Girl Scout hyper knot. <laughs> Angels and demons, I take it. Don't tear the front of the box, that's art. Oh, it's signed by a lot of friends, signed by a lot of friends on the first page. Angels and Devils, the History of Good and Evil and the History of Christian Art, uh, which has rather to do with the project I'm on right now, as my friends know. Um, 
So I'm, I'm very happy to touch. Thank you so much. Uh, Phil is working on a project about war in heaven. Um, I've also been told by my colleagues that Angels and Devils accurately uh, reflects the composition of our own department. Um, and uh, the only thing we ask you, Phil, is during the time of the reception, if you could name who's who in which category, that would be very, very helpful as you leave. So, um, Thank you all so much again for being here this evening. We really do appreciate it. We know many of you have come from quite far away, uh, quite a distance, and made an effort to be here. Uh, please take the time now to enjoy some refreshments, uh, to congratulate Phil personally uh, for his work here at Utah State, and uh, enjoy uh, each other's company. Thank you all. Good evening.